to open things up this morning, and uh, what I want to do is set a bit of a state context in which we're dealing with the various issues of uh, the state budget, the state economy, uh, where we are. There's a broader context than that, though. And that broader context is uh, the, the nation and, and the world in which we live. But one part of that is that kind of is the, the overarching umbrella uh, as, as we meet and talk today is uh, just to give you one figure, uh, let me set a bit of a context. Many times you hear from people in leadership positions that they don't have choices, that they are forced to do what they do. Uh, that generally gets translated in, into a, a, a sentence that says, we don't have any choices, there is no money. And, and I think the context in which we're meeting today is to say that simply is not true. There are choices. Choices have been made. And it's those choices that we're trying to, to, to provoke ourselves uh, to uh, understand uh, what are the resources we have and what choices do we have. You can't say there aren't any choices uh, when uh, we have a Michigan citizens are sending annually uh, to Washington uh, something I believe over 19 uh, billion dollars, 19 and a half billion dollars uh, that we're sending uh, uh, for military spending alone. Now that's a choice. Uh, and and it, it's a number that has a pretty substantial impact. <laughs> Uh, when you talk about what is the Michigan deficit? Well, before we, we deal with the current budget proposal, uh, the deficit was identified as $1.8 billion. And compare that to our shipping of $19.5 billion uh, to Washington. And I, I think we'll hear more about that uh, uh, impact as, as uh, we go on. Uh, are you familiar with it? the concept in the phrase, starve the beast. The, the concept is one that I thought first was a pejorative that good guys like us said about others. But in fact, it's the others who said, this is what our strategy and philosophy is. Starve the beast means that I'm not opposed to education. I'm not opposed to health care. I'm not opposed to environmental protection. I'm not opposed to uh, roads that don't have high bowls. But I don't have any choice if I can convince people that the enemy is taxes, if the, the enemy is revenue. And therefore, if you can starve the beast, eliminate the funding, then you never have to be opposed to education or health care or fill in the blank. Uh, and this is a philosophy. There's even a definition. Uh, that you can find online, to cut taxes with the intent of using the reduced revenue as an excuse to drastically reduce the size and numbers of services offered by a government. And that's the philosophy that now uh, and many have affirmed, and, and our, our and many members of the legislature and of Congress have signed a statement that uh, says, my first commitment is a commitment to never raise any more taxes. Uh, great debates that it's kind of like uh, in seminary when we talked about the number of angels on the head of a pin, you know, things of, of that kind. Uh, now we find these uh, political leaders talking about, let's see if I shift the tax and lower somebody's, raise somebody else's, is that a tax increase that I pledged them to do that? Or uh, So you get these kinds of uh, these kinds of, of foolish uh, uh, debates. Uh, the uh, uh, Grover Norquist, the name that probably is familiar to many of you, uh, who has been fighting on behalf of starving the beast, said, I'm not opposed uh, to uh, uh, government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. So, it's a very modest concept in that. Uh, <laughs> how that 
translates to you and me every day is that you and I now are uh, debating everywhere we go on how do we solve Michigan's fiscal problem by discussing how do we cut, what do we cut. We're not talking about what is an optimal education system. We're not talking about what is an optimal justice system. Uh, new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Michigan was just appointed, uh, chosen by, by uh, his colleagues. And he was asked by the press the day he was selected, what is the first responsibility and concern of, uh, of you as the Chief Justice, the head of our justice system in the state? His response was, in the present time, our concern is to find out how do we reduce the cost of the courts. Now, I want to tell you, that's not the chief priority in terms of the justice system in this state. It is to provide a system of justice. And it's not to figure out how do we reduce programs. It may be to find uh, efficiencies in those programs. But we're now debating, all of us, no matter where we come from, are, uh, have been sucked into an understanding by those who have framed the question for us that the issues are how do we make it uh, uh, and, and, and we are not talking about how do we provide uh, preschool, how, uh, you know, how, how do we assure uh, that there's health care for the uh, elderly and so on. Uh, the right agenda would be to address the broader question. Uh, what kind of state and what kind of public services do we want? And, and that would be the, the, the focus and, and concern that, that would be uh, the right one. Do we want to reduce childhood poverty? Uh, if that's the case, we probably would question the elimination of an earned income tax credit uh, uh, that would immediately push uh, 14,000 more people, children, into poverty households. That might coming to mind as a question if that was our, our goal. Uh, you know, because of, of the discussion that's been going on in, in Michigan, uh, uh, you're familiar with the Kids Count report that just came out, uh, it's an annual report that just came out in the uh, uh, last uh, couple of weeks, uh, published by the League for Human Services. It tells us that the percentage of children in Michigan under the age of 18 who are living in poverty in the year 2000 was 14 percent. That was in 2000. In 2009, that's 23 percent. There's another way of saying 23 percent, and that's say it, you know nearly one out of four kids in Michigan are are, are living in, in poverty uh, situation. Uh, those figures suggest to me that it's a questionable service to take a state action that by itself would put another 14,000 kids into the poverty, uh, poverty ranks, if, if I can say that. Uh, we know some things, uh, thank God, it doesn't mean they necessarily affect our policy decisions, but we do know some things. Uh, we know some things, for example, about what works and what doesn't work. Michigan has the oldest study of preschool. Uh, the Ypsilanti Preschool High School study is over 40 years old now. What does that study say? Following people, there was a, a, a control group and, and then a group that went through preschool. And what do we know about those who went through, through those two programs uh, and, and how they compare? Well, we know that if they were in the preschool program, they're more likely today to be in stable marriages, less likely to have ever been in prison. Uh, less likely to have struggled uh, with various kinds of uh, drug abuse and, and so on. We know those systems work. The legislature and leadership have cut a third and then a fourth, uh, right, and then half, and, and now cutting more out of our preschool funding and, and program. Uh, yet we know those things work. Uh, it's that challenge that we have. Our goal then must be to create a tax system where we have adequate, fair, stable, those three words we remember, adequate, fair, stable, 
uh, revenues to pay for the services that we need and, and we need. In Michigan, between 2001 and 2010, we lost as a state nearly, or a little bit over, 850,000 jobs. Now you can look around and make all kinds of analyses and so on about why are we in economic trouble? But you can't deny that that's a pretty basic number. If you had lost 850,000 jobs, it's not because of some policy decision. Uh, it's because of a various number of effects, economic effects, that have resulted in, in that, uh, uh, that job loss. As of September in 2010, Michigan had lost 867,500 jobs from the peak in, in June of uh, 2000. 51% uh, of those jobs, 442,000 of them, uh, were from the manufacturing sector. Surprise, no. We, we know about that. that we've been affected in, in various kinds of, of ways. Uh, the total level of payroll employment in Michigan during September of 2010, last September, was roughly equal to the number of jobs that existed in Michigan uh, during 1988. In 1970, the personal income levels in Michigan ranked 12th highest in all the states. We were considered a high income uh, state. In 1980, that 12% had us ranked now 15th highest, dropping a little bit. In 2000, a little bit more to 18 of the states. In 2009, 37. So we've seen that 867,000 jobs lost translate into uh, an income average in this state uh, that's now 37 of, of all the, the states. That has to affect uh, our ability to provide uh, services to pay uh, for goods and, and services. What has state government done in this context? State government has done a couple of things. It's cut taxes and it's cut programs. Is that the right response to that reality of growing numbers of kids in poverty, of growing job loss, of, of growing economic uh, vulnerability? This is the only that's spelled O-N-L-Y, only state with a general fund revenue decline between 2000 and 2010, the only state. We are, if we went out on the street and asked people, uh, you know, are we a high tax state, are our taxes increasing and so on, people say, yeah, we are, they are increasing and so on. Truth is, uh, taxes have fallen in this state significantly. Uh, Consequently, services have fallen in this state significantly. Tax reductions have taken two forms, reductions in tax rates and increases in tax loopholes, credits, exemptions, and, and, and so on. In those two ways, we narrowed and narrowed and narrowed our tax base. So fewer and fewer of us are taxed as much as we were. If you look at overall tax burden, uh, revenue as a percent of personal income, was, in 2000, 8%. In 2010, it was 7%. So we're seeing a, a, a reduction in terms of overall burden. Uh, so state government in Michigan has reduced in size over the past decade and declined in, in very significant measures. Uh, a significant portion of the decline is related to the uh, tax expenditures and so on, the credits, exemptions, and, and so on. Uh, I, I won't take time this morning to go into that in detail, although I, I, I would love to, and we can talk about it more at, at uh, in, in, interest, interest, in, in between other meetings. Uh, <laughs> in 2007, when the legislature and governor amended the Michigan business tax to impose an annual surcharge, uh, there were a couple of outrageous examples of provisions they included in the bill. And I'll mention just uh, a, a couple of those. Now this was 
The Michigan business tax was put in place and business said, we no longer like the single business tax, we have a better way, and they wrote uh, the Michigan business tax. In writing that tax, they included a couple of exemptions. One of them for Myers 50 acres, you may have heard about them. We can't say in the law it was Myers 50 acres, so if you read the bill, it talks about so many feet of warehouse space and headquartered in Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they found a way to give them a credit that allows them to uh, deduct from the, all, all costs up to the lesser of their MBT, Michigan Business Tax Liability, or $2,260,000 uh, for several tax years. So while they're instituting a tax, they are at the same time uh, giving certain businesses a tax exemption or reduction. Another was in that same bill, uh, the International Speedway, uh, um, like the name, down, uh, the NASCAR track. MIS. MIS, right. Uh, and, and gave them a tax break uh, for uh, uh, capital improvements uh, down there. So in, in the midst of this crunch, uh, well, and, and one might say, why? And the answer might be, well, who was their lobbyist? Or something like that. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, very compelling messages. Uh, the combination of economic collapse in Michigan over the past decade, the decrease in tax rates, the growth in tax expenditures, has resulted in a total uh, state revenue decrease of nearly 30 uh, million bucks, uh, and, and is is the uh, 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 you know a major part of, of what we're facing at the, at the present time. Uh, Thirty billion. Uh, then that's forced government to limit uh, tax cuts and expenditures. Okay, that sets a bit of context. Now let's talk about what Governor Snyder has proposed and what we're faced with at, at the moment. In, in the tax uh, and budget proposal, business taxes in Michigan, under the, the Snyder proposal, would be cut 86%. 86%. Individual taxes, income tax, would be increased 32%. Now, you might think that that's a shift, and you would be correct. Uh, so, we're, we're talking here about a philosophy that underlies it, that says the problem with the Michigan economy is addressed by reducing taxes on business, kind of regardless of the cost and impact. Uh, and that if we address it that way, our problems will be solved, our economic problems. And, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but almost quoting uh, verbatim. That would have said, to test that philosophy, I would ask you to remember Michigan's history. And Michigan's history is one in which we have cut, cut, cut the, the corporate tax burden. At the same time, we have lost 867,000 jobs. What am I getting wrong? Uh, and, and, and to argue that more cut, cut, cutting would suddenly create uh, a, a million jobs is a little hard to, to put forward. I have in my notes. Uh, a, uh, uh, a review of uh, uh, some studies that are, have been done on the economy by uh, the Upjohn Employment Institute down in Kalamazoo that looked at a bunch of these stimulus incentive studies uh, that all come to the conclusion that they don't work. Essentially, for my paraphrasing is, if you have X deficit and you address it uh, through uh, revenues uh, uh, increase, you create in the private sector job employment. If you do it through public program cuts, you reduce uh, the, the creation of uh, uh, jobs in the, in the private sector. Uh, okay, 
who would pay the increases in the Snyder uh, proposal? The Detroit News finance editor, and I like to quote him because usually it's not finance editors from the Detroit News that I rely upon, uh, <laughs> says in an article this week, if you're poor or old, get ready to pay more under Governor Rick Snyder's tax plan. Uh, so I think that's a good summary of, of what happens in terms of the, uh, uh, of the impact. Uh, the, uh, they look in that article at a low-income working single parent making $22,000 a year whose taxes would increase $689. Contrast this, he said, with a family whose income is five times that of a single parent. Their tax would be nudged up $77. Uh, so if we're talking about fair impact uh, and, and uh, justice, this might even bear on a moral question about uh, um, the earned income tax credit, uh, which the governor proposes to eliminate, amounts to an average $432. Uh, to working families, most of them with children. I told you the figure we developed in the League of Human Services is that would be a 14,000 increase in the number of, of kids in, in, uh, in poverty. Uh, the governor proposes uh, to, in, to uh, provide this 86% cut for corporations, uh, an 18% cut in funding Michigan's public universities. Many have argued Education is critical to economic recovery. Uh, revenue sharing payments to cities, villages, counties, in some cases eliminated, in others substantially uh, reduced. Uh, a loss of $344 million to local governments. Translate that into uh, law enforcement, fire protection, and so on. The governor's budget proposal recommends a $470 per pupil reduction in funding for local schools. And it proposes to take $896 million, now designated for local schools, shift it to community colleges and uh, 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 higher education institutions. You know the story. Do you remember the Jacques Costo film? I don't remember it vividly when they threw the bloody meat into the water against the sharks. And when the meat was gone, the sharks went at each other. It is this this creation of, of uh, our cannibalism among many of us in, in various parts of the human service area who, who now find ourselves saying, well, is, is EITC more critical or um, preschool? You know, which of those uh, should we do? And so we're left to make that, uh, uh, that policy uh, decision. Uh, and another little observed factor in Michigan, uh, jobs and economic development, is uh, the immigration law and policy. Uh, the governor has addressed this only in the state of the state, as far as I know, which he, he, he sounded refreshingly open to uh, and recognizing the importance of immigrants to our economy. Uh, again, at the league, one of our folks has been looking at the economic impact of, of the immigration uh, Michigan immigration. Michigan immigrants make up less than 6% of the population, but are responsible for more than 32% of all high-tech startup businesses in, uh, in this state. Uh, this makes Michigan third in the nation for producing new high-tech uh, business opportunities. Between 96 and, and uh, 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 2007, Michigan immigrants represented 15.8% of new business owners, so three times more likely to start a, a new business. Our state's education system attracts a lot of foreign students, as you know, and uh, uh, total that up, they contribute over $600 million a year to our economy. Well, I'm trying to set some context in which we, we think about uh, the choices 